Thank you very much for, uh, for having me here. Um, I am George Contreras. I, I'm a law professor and, and a lawyer, but my original training was in electrical engineering. And I also spent a lot of time representing engineers at the Internet Engineering Task Force, which is a large standards organization. Um, and one thing I've observed over the years is that uh, engineers in standards organizations especially love to pretend that they're lawyers. Um, and lawyers, especially my colleagues, love to pretend that they're economists. And uh, I have to uh, start by saying I'm not an economist, and I want to uh, make that quite clear. But I, I think that this uh, misunderstanding and, and overlap of these three disciplines is part of what has gotten us into this holdup debate uh, that we are experiencing right now, and I think some of the problems that we have seen with respect to it. So with that... Introduction, yes, so, so I also, I'll just reiterate very quickly some of the uh, points that Steve made, and, and without repeating them, all of, this is obviously Oliver Williamson, um, Nobel Prize winning economist, and, and one of the first problems that we see and that we're embroiled in now is this definitional question when we talk about hold, what is holdup, right? We have opportunism with guile, which economists uh, refer to, um, but, but there are also others, an uh, expanding spectrum of what you might consider holdup or what people in this debate referred to as holdup. Um, we talk about the lock-in effect and the corner complements and so forth resulting in excessive rent, um, all the way to, it seems like at another end of the spectrum, um, any uh, attempt patent holders to maximize their returns is being called holdup. There's an imprecision in the use of this term, and I think we spent a lot of time arguing about what this term means. So we have a definitional debate going on. In addition to the definitional debate, there's sort of three other axes on which we are debating one another. One is the empirical axis that Steve uh, presented very well. There uh, is an effects axis, and what I really consider to be mostly a distraction. On the empirical side, um, we have a number of, of papers, uh, Steve's and uh, Galetovic's uh, included, which make uh, do very good empirical work trying to find whether or not there is evidence of patent holdup, however you define it, in the marketplace. And if not, then we draw conclusions from that. The effects arguments say that, well, even if there were some holdup, again, we see the market is doing very well, um, so there's not really a problem, or maybe there's no holdup. Maybe that's more evidence that there's not. The holdout argument is simply uh, to say, well, even if holdup is happening or it's not, uh, it's not such a good thing, this other thing is happening too. It's holdout on the implementer side, so perhaps that to some degree excuses or counterbalances or should make us look again at holdup. Right? These are three axes of the same debate, and my question is why we're actually having this debate at all and how it implicates the law and whether we should try to take a step back up and think about whether or not we need to fight about and resolve all of these questions. So on the empirical side, is there holdup? Where can we find it? Um, one problem that we see is that we can't very easily find direct evidence of holdup um, if it's out there because most of the agreements in which you would find it are confidential. So at least for the market and scholars, um, it's going to be very difficult for us to find direct evidence to start with. Um, Shapiro, who we've heard a lot from uh, about in this conference already, has theorized that, well, even if you can't find direct evidence, this is the kind of market where it's likely to arise, so we should assume that it's there. Again, I am not an economist and cannot speak to whether or not this is all true. But then uh, Steve and others have looked for secondary effects of whether there are reduced output, increased prices uh, as, as evidence of uh, you know, what you couldn't see in sort of the primary case, um, have not found anything. That being said, there is certainly anecdotal evidence um, that holdup is occurring in individualized cases, um, complaints made to regulatory agencies, and so forth. In this case, um, we also have the phenomenon that uh, 
action that's already been taken by regulators and lawmakers may itself have reduced the prevalence of the phenomenon, so there is less of it to find, right? And this is what I call the Ebola effect in the United States. Thank goodness we haven't had any outbreaks of Ebola, um, but that isn't because Ebola is not a problem, it's because our public health authorities have taken drastic measures to ensure that it doesn't become a problem. So we don't find it, but because we don't find it doesn't necessarily mean that it itself is not a bad thing, right? It is not a problem. And so we have regulators, we have the, you know, Centers for Disease Control to thank for this, and other regulators perhaps in the holdup area. On the effect side, the question is whether it is convincing that because we have a wonderful wireless telecommunications market, increasing functionality, decreasing prices, there's no problem, there should be considered to be no problem with, uh, with this market. I and all of us in this room benefit from the market, right? But the problem is, and, and I, I disagree with Steve on this point, there, there could be counterfactuals, we just don't have them um, to show how technology could be better. And it certainly could be cheaper. Um, even though we have low prices, um, they could be lower. And we see this in other countries. Um, in fact, I, I would be surprised if the, uh, the smartphone with the African children that we saw, which is a heartwarming uh, image, whether that phone cost as much as my iPhone cost me in, uh, in, in the United States. Um, okay. It's also true that anti-competitive conduct can occur even in cases where you have markets that are experiencing these positive indicators. And there are historical examples of this. And I just want to go back very briefly to the late 19th century to think about some of these historical examples when these same arguments could potentially have been made prior to the adoption of the Sherman Antitrust Act in 1890. If you take a look at what was happening in the 1870s and the 1880s, how might these arguments have been made, right? You would think that there should be in some of the 20 markets identified by the, uh, by the United States government as rife with uh, collusion and anti-competitive monopolization, um, we should see reductions in output. But in many of these markets, the salt market, for example, um, the market for petroleum, for steel, these are all in the top most uh, anti-competitive markets identified by the government in the decade prior to the adoption of the Sherman Act, output was increasing dramatically. Uh, customers were happy. Here's coal. Coal, uh, again, um, subject to significant antitrust enforcement in the 19th century after the Sherman Act is adopted, uh, despite increasing output and then prices. You would expect prices to be increasing, but in many of these markets, prices were also decreasing um, dramatically in the years prior to the adoption of the Sherman Act. Now, I'm not arguing that the manufacturers of lead or sugar were good guys by any stretch of the imagination, um, but I would pose to you the question, would we say because of these positive market indicators that the Sherman Act was unnecessary, that there wasn't a dysfunction in the marketplace? There can be other ill effects of anti-competitive behavior, including reduced competition, barriers to entry by new market entrants, um, and potentially reduced innovation, certainly in those markets. So why should the law care about holdup? Um, holdup is an economic phenomenon, market inefficiencies uh, result, and holdup can also be evidence of anti-competitive conduct. But holdup itself, if you look at the law, the case law, the, uh, the statutory law in Europe, in the US and elsewhere, holdup is not itself an illegal uh, uh, form of conduct, right? It's not mentioned by name in any of the definitional instances that we've talked about. Um, holdup certainly can be legally actionable when it results in anti-competitive uh, injury, right? And we've seen abuse of market power, abuse of market position cases, deception cases in the last decade, exclusion cases have been brought, discrimination cases. Those are cognizable under our existing competition and antitrust laws. We also have breaches of private commitments, FRAN commitments, which are cognizable under contract and estoppel and various other theories, possibly uh, competition and antitrust theories. And I have no problem with any of these theories. 
theories. However, to prove an anti-competitive uh, harm, to prove anti-competitive behavior, the law does not look to statistical or empirical market-wide evidence. In fact, that's not necessarily required to prove that an individual actor, an individual firm, acted in an anti-competitive manner. Right? Only the conduct of the accused party is probative of their wrongdoing. Um, the Federal Circuit in the United States reemphasized this in the Erickson and Dealing case, in which it found for the patent holder because, uh, among many other things, um, the, uh, the plaintiffs were not able to produce actual relevant evidence of holdup um, conducted by that party, notwithstanding the potential that there was holdup throughout the market. And again, we can just consider, compare this to any other crime. You're accused of a crime. Well, certainly it makes no difference what the crime statistics are for your city, whether there's a crime wave or whether it's peaceful times. All that matters is the conduct of the actual accused party, not uh, market-wide evidence, which is, again, a question for economists and, and policymakers, but generally not for lawyers and judges. Preventing holdup uh, is a valid policy goal, and SSOs have experimented with different policy measures to address holdup. Disclosures of SEPs, uh, FRAND licensing, we've talked about many of these before. About 10 years ago, we had a spate of conferences on ex-ante disclosure of licensing terms, which were fun to participate in. We now have the policy experimentation done by the IEEE. Um, you know, this is where this sort of experimentation and policy development should be taking place in the private standard setting organizations. These measures may be successful or unsuccessful, right? If they're unsuccessful, we have competition in the marketplace of ideas and those SSOs will not be successful. If they're successful, well then more power to them, right? Exit, exit is always a possible strategy um, when you have uh, this sort of marketplace experimentation. Finally, I'll wrap up, I know we're uh, short on time, so I just say, you know, even though economists treat anecdotal evidence as, as something, you know, somewhat uh, irrelevant, anecdotal evidence is the basis of the legal system. It's called witness testimony, right, direct evidence. It is the most important thing in finding a particular accused party to be guilty or not guilty of a particular offense. Um, on the other hand, statistical and market-wide evidence is not required in legal cases. The legislature uh, certainly can take action if it wants to. Um, we've seen economic policy made for all sorts of reasons, and economic uh, input and uh, evidence is certainly a valid input to that process. Um, but as far as agency uh, enforcement um, in this area, I would argue that agencies should continue to monitor and investigate and enforce the antitrust laws as we have them, as they're written um, uh, to prosecute anti-competitive conduct using the doctrines that we know and have without creating a new doctrine of holdup that we're going to argue about forever. Um, more transparency. This is just a plug for other lines of work that I do. It would be great if we could see more of those uh, agreements uh, so that everybody was on the same page with what's actually happening. Um, but please, you know, I, I, not to say that I am not looking forward to next year's Hold Up Conference, but uh, I, I think that we can accomplish a lot in the market without um, uh, obsessing over this debate. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.